CBS to go. We have a talk in Berlin, very close to here. And I stole that title because I really like uh, the saying from him that is, uh, the present always changes, the future looks brighter, and I tend to rewrite the past. So, um, And after my speak, you will probably guess why. So, just a few words uh, for my person. I'm then and since '98, and probably uh, there are not many people using Blender more than I, or more years than I. I used to. So, enough for, my, for me. So, I, I like to know you a bit. Who already knows Blender? Raise your arms, please. Oh, great, great. More than a few times started. Twice? Okay. Counts. <laughs> three times? <laughs> More than three times? Okay. Um, uh, so, question 10 years ago, because we haven't had a normal file review or something. So, mostly people start Blender and didn't know even how to quit Blender. So, they always needed to kill this task manager or something or kill in Linux and nowadays it should be more obvious Downloads of Blender, 
And nowadays, where, where the um, files are spread, we can't count it anymore. So there's a huge community of Blender, which is some of the strengths of Blender. So to understand why Blender is in some respects so different, different um, I can give you a small timeline how Blender was developed. Um, Blender was uh, developed in a in -house, as an in-house tool in, in the Netherlands. It was a studio called Neo Geo. It doesn't have to do with the Neo Geo console. It's just a name. And this was 95. So, John Rosendahl and um, Frank van Dijk um, decided to, to rewrite their old tools they had written in the last uh, since, since 1990 or so. And the first version was 95, the first version of Blender. I think the last version, uh, the latest, uh, no, the oldest version you can get is probably 1.2 or 1.21 and for SGI. So they first used Amiga and I think also some PCs and then switched to SGI computers. And they did um, 98, a first release for a freeware release, it wasn't open source then, for SGI. <clears throat> and after that they released the uh, same year a version for Linux. And that's the point where I came to Blender as a um, chief editor of the Linux magazine in Germany asked me, uh, he heard uh, about a new 3D tool and asked me if I want to write something about it. So I did. And that was the time I started with Blender. Uh, the download was at that time 800 kilobyte. So it fits on one floppy. And well, it was basically the same without the game engine, basically the same uh, creation pipeline as nowadays. I mean, we have, of course, a good development so far, but basically you could do all the steps for a, new, uh, for a movie with Blender, without audio. So a big boost was um, this version 1.5 with a Windows port. And there was a manual and a CK which unlocks several um, things in Blender which you have to pay for the CK and it was 99. And that gave a big boost. The community was, I, I don't know, it was 10 times bigger from one day to another. <clears throat> and somehow that was also the starting of going down for Blender for the commercial blender, of course. Um, in year 2000, they invented or reinvented in blender, I have to say, a game engine in blender. And there were some venture capitalists who said, OK, we want to rule the 3D world in internet by 2005 or something, they did say. And they put millions of dollars into the Blender uh, source and um, made a company called Not a Number. Um, Ton Rosendahl, the chief developer, was uh, CEO, I don't know, no. And so um, that lasts two years, and then the dot com bubble ba bursts, and Blender was in the danger to just get locked because the source wasn't free and the <clears throat> rights to the source belongs to the trustee of the foundation, uh, of the company. So, Ton Rosendahl said, mm, I don't want to have Blender dying and we have to get the source from the trustees. So, he got the at that time, totally strange idea to ask the community to give money to release Blender as source, open source. And really in a few months, I think two and a half months, we had 100,000 euros and could buy the source code and some rights to the logo and stuff from the trustee. 
And that was the starting uh, of the open source uh, history of Blender. It was with version 2.25 in the year 2002. Um, then the development started a bit slow because Blender was never meant to be open source. So it was, uh, Ton always said, it was just a rewrite of his brain. So not many people could actually read the source code because all the comments were in Dutch. Uh, it, was, um, it was not a mess, but it was very uncommon program. So <clears throat> the first, first steps for external developers were very, very hard, I guess. And so the beginning was a bit slow. So um, in year 2004, these first uh, problems were tackled. And we had a, um, a GUI and modeling refresh, and also the game engine back. So that was uh, another big step for my thinking. And because the game engine used some physics library, which which we couldn't li re-license as GPL. The programmer or the developer was, wasn't giving it free, so it was a problem. Then uh, 2004, we had it back with a new physics engine. Um, and then the uh, development starts to really take off um, with the uh, open movies I will talk about later. And with version 2.5, we had another big change in Blender because the whole GUI and event system was rewritten. And that took, I think, two or three years internally. I mean, not internally, because the source were still open. But the first, first productive, ready version came about 2009. And nowadays, we are about uh, version 2.65 or something. Five, I guess so. Okay? 2.65. Yes. And we have a new renderer and uh, a special effects pipeline. I will come to that a bit later. So that was the history. So the use as in-house software still still tangled some points of Blender. So many, to not many, some tools are still, still like an in-house production tool. So your customer wants you to have particles. Ton sat down and said, oh, I need some CGraph uh, proceedings and programmed some particles. So but they were never, never finished. And so there are still some open ends in Blender. But as always in open source, if there's no developer who has interest. So I, I like to ask who's developer and thinks about developing with Blender? Nobody. Sad, really sad. Um, because the developers are really our most important members in the community. Without them, would have lost. So the actual Blender 2.6 is uh, mostly a, a, a thing which, which was done for, for the latest um, open movie, Mango, Project Mango. The movie is called Tears of Steel. Maybe somebody has already seen it on the internet, um, or even bought the DVD. Um, we have some, some um, really important uh, changes in there. That's a B-Mesh, that's a complete rewrite of the uh, modeling uh, system or the, the system how models are stored internally, which al also um, affects some modeling style, maybe. And we have Cycles, which is a new rendering, rendering engine. I think Kai will also show them. And <coughs> sorry, we have Camera and Motion Tracking. Camera and, <clears throat> camera and motion tracking is obviously um, 
important for for a combination of real film and uh, computer animated stuff. We have an ocean simulator and GPO and CPU tile-based compositing, which is important when you like to handle more than full HD stuff. And of course, a lot more. So, because the uh, open movies are so important for the Blender development, I will show you all the three open movies and one open game shortly, not, not the whole film. And first was 2006, and it's called Elephant's Dream. And I think it was the first open movie, and open movie means that not only the film is put on a Creative Commons license, but all the assets, all the textures, all the sounds, everything you get on a DVD and you can reshare it. You can uh, um, buy attribute or something, so you are mostly free to do everything with it if you like and just put the name of the official Blender Foundation on it. So. Um, that was something completely new at that, that, that time. I'm not sure if that, that uh, is also used by other production teams. So the, the idea is to put some artists together making a film in maybe six months or eight months and having them tied together with developers and so when a, artist wants to have a new feature or wants to have a bug fixed, it can be immediately done. And for that, they used, uh, they, in their, they made up a little studio in the Netherlands. And the first film, Elephant's Dream, was a big success. I mean, it's, it's probably not the best film and not the best computer animation. But the idea to develop Blender was a really big success. Blender major it in that time really good. So two years later, we had a second uh, open movie, Big Bug Bunny. At that time, the, I mean, Elephant's Dream is a bit dark and maybe also scary, I don't know, um, and hard to understand. So we always asked what they smoked while writing it. So um, Big Bug Bunny is a well, classic cartoon stuff with a maybe twisted end. And um, the idea or the production target was to make fur workable. I mean, we need furry little characters there for rodents, I think. And um, I have to look. One fact. Well, yes. And I think in, in some respects it's still the, the, most, the most liked and most played film because when you go to some, some uh, store where they sell big TVs, you will probably find Big Buck Bunny running on some. So it's so nice you can show it to your kids and they won't get scared. So after that, we had an open game, which was proposed to, to enhance the game engine, or no, not the game engine Blender, but um, the API or the, the connection between external game engines and Blender, so using Blender as a production tool for games. In the end, that didn't work out because the game engine development for Crystal Space, that was a game engine which was used, didn't proceed as, as they liked. So um, some in the end, they, they, the um, developers for Crystal, uh, Crystal Space left uh, the production and uh, there was no game ready. So one um, artist of Blender decided to try it in the Blender game engine and he did a prototype in, I think, two days. And so they was decided, we have one month left, we put it on the Blender game engine. And um, in the end, there was really a game with some levels and gameplay. 
I mean, it mostly consists for Python scripts, so there isn't, isn't that much game engine in there from Blender game engine, but, well, for that time, it was quite good. So in 2010, uh, we have a new open movie. This time, uh, there was a, the development target was to, to get Blender 2.5 production ready. And in the beginning of um, Synthel, or oh, the movie making, movie making uh, in the studio, Blender 2.5 wasn't ready for production. So they, they did one month using Blender 2.5 a little bit and using the old Blender and then Ton said, okay, now you have to stop using, you are always using Blender 2.5. And that was a really hard time for the artists, also for the developers who have to fix all that stuff. And, but I mean, the outcome was very good. So, I mean, Sintel is a nice film. It was interesting technical aspects, and after that we really had a Blender 2.5, which was workable at that time. So the latest um, open movie, Tears of Steel, is, as I said, a combination of real film and computer elements. And that, of course, um, needs to have motion tracking, so you can put your CGI elements into the film without the audience having knowing what, what is computer animated and what not. Mm. There's, as always in, in, in the open movies, there's a big making of. Here you can get many inspiration, inspirations, what, what was done there and what were the problems doing that film. So, a few words. What time is it? Okay. A few words to the um, Blender organization. I mean, uh, Blender is uh, open source as GPL2 on a GPL2 licensed. So in principle, you can take Blender source code and start your own Blender project, no problem. Um, in the past, there were always some branches of Blender. At the moment, we have also branches, but they are still hosted by the Blender Foundation so that the connection is not lost. So that's an, for an open source project a good situation because you don't scatter your um, developers all around the world. And this shared source code is one of the really strong points and the other one is the community, you, which, which uses Blender, which testing Blender and, um, well, it's just a good communication. There are, as always, um, I mean, there are many fanboys for Blender saying, crying, yeah, Blender, Blender's the best. Um, that's, that's a bit twisted thing about it, but the most community is, is very big and very helpful. Um, for, for having or for handling the, the commercial and, and, and legal um, aspects, Ton Rosendahl uh, founded the Blender Foundation, that's a Dutch foundation, like a Stiftung here in, uh, in Germany. And they, well, they connect all the developers, the community, and the business around Blender together. A bit, or my, I mean, more the legal uh, stuff. And Ton Rosendahl is still, still, I mean, the head of development. He is not a dictator, but he knows how to, to lead people to something he wants. So, um, but that's, that's quite important because otherwise there will be splitting and Blender is a quite huge project uh, at the time and it's too hard to, to, hand, to handle it with, with a complete democracy. So it, it will not work. So far, we had the luck that um, there were some developers quitting for uh, Blender developing, but um, we don't have a split or something. So that's a good, good sign and, and a sign that, that the Blender Foundation does a real good job. 
So there was, um, I mean, there's always, it's a foundation and they don't, they shouldn't be a commercial uh, studio or something. So the Blender Institute was uh, founded, which does the business part of everything, like the shop training, sponsoring, getting sponsorship, getting money, spending money. So that is the Blender Institute. They're also hosting um, Blender tutorials and Blender courses and something. And the newest uh, development, which is sadly a bit slow in the progress right now, is the Blender network, which claimed to be a network of Blender professionalists and connecting them together. So building a web of trust. So if you like to have some, some developer who can develop for Blender or an artist who has a specialized for rigging or something, you will find it there. And it's open for everybody for searching, but to, be, to present you, you have to pay a little amount of money, I think 50 euros or something in the, by, by year. And well, it's interesting idea. As I said, and at the moment, it's a bit quite about the Blender network. I hope it will progress later. So the community uh, consists about 90 active developers, maybe 10 core developers, and they always uh, have a, uh, they're always um, responsible for, for a special part in Blender. So we have a game, some game engine core developers, a few, some uh, OpenGL, some GUI developers, and they're always responsible for that little part in Blender or bigger part, and hundreds of more or less regular contributors, hundreds of websites and I don't know, uncounted people participating online and doing tutorials or presenting their stuff. And, and the biggest task maybe in the next years will be to professionalize Blender. So getting away from the hobbyists, stuff which are very important for us because it's always a start for, for a commercial thing. It's like me, I, I used my hobby for writing for Blender and then I switched uh, to more professional way using Blender. And it's somehow a bit, the professional users are somehow a bit hidden in the community. Um, that's mostly because for a real artists, it doesn't matter which tools he used. If you use an ax or, or a knife to cut a nice wooden statue, it's, it doesn't matter. So, um, and the other way, uh, other thing is that companies somehow don't like to talk about using open source. I don't know why, but that's, that's the case often. And somehow they are also tied with commercial licenses for 3D Max or Autodesk or other Autodesk products, and they, they are not allowed to, to say they use a different tool. So. That's, that's quite often the case. So if you put Blender in Google, you can find all the blender.org, which is the main uh, hub for, for Blender, Blender artists, Blender nation, blendpolis.de for German um, users, blendswap, where you can uh, get models of Blender and put it online. And short for the future, after Tears of Steel, um, there will be about a year of stabilization of the Blender code and finishing up things which wasn't finished in the, during the movie. Um, there's an Android port which already uh, runs on, on Blender, uh, I mean on, on tablets and stuff. Of course, there are problems with using touch for, for little Blender buttons, that's quite impossible. I think WebGL will be a big part of Blender possible. I don't know. And the next open movie will be a feature film. I mean, a full, full movie. 
and it is planned to to get studios on all over the world to working together on that film. I mean, it's so far just an idea, but um, the other films worked very well, so why not that idea from Tom Rosendahl? So normally I can answer some questions with Blender, but I think I will hand over to Kai. He will just do a little uh, object in Blender so you can see how to work with Blender. And, but I will give you the chance to ask me some questions about Blender or Blender GPL or whatever. So questions, please, if you like. If not, we start. OK, no questions. That can mean you are fall asleep or my talk was so good, so. Okay, Kai, please. Okay, thanks. So, hello. <coughs> I'm sorry. Um, my name is Kai Kostak. I'm a 3D artist and animator using Blender since uh, five years now on a professional level. I started uh, working for an advertising agency um, where I could pretty easily introduce Blender since they didn't have a 3D department at the time. And after that, I, two, days, uh, two years later, I just started my own business running uh, based on Blender. And <clears throat> from there, I'm just doing this uh, to the day, um, just using Blender for everything related to 3D. And today, I'm going to show you how to use Blender to create something, to produce an actual device. I've been asked to create a device or anything related to the um, conference type of open source projects. Um, <clears throat> you, can Blender, you can use Blender for all, all types of visualization or um, design process uh, kind of things to just create an, an, um, uh, your device, uh, how it looks and how it uh, might appear. And you can, of course, use Blender to improve your presentations or to um, <clears throat> just create an eye catcher for your, uh, for, to, to just uh, gain a, a wider audience. And I'm just, uh, getting our hands dirty on Blender, so I'm just starting Blender right now, and I'm doing a live presentation of it. Um, it will be a bit quick, uh, since I don't have the time to just explain every button I'm clicking right, right now, um, so I'm just uh, enabling here a little helper, so you see what short shortcuts I'm using in the lower left, left here on, on the display, and you see I can immediately uh, work in the 3D space here. You see, this is a, a default scene. If I run Blender, you will always see this. And in the middle, you see the default cube, as it is called. It's a <clears throat> default object in Blender. It's a geometry object. On the left, you see a camera object, and here on the right, a lamp object. And below it, uh, you have some options related to the viewport, of course. You can switch layers, you can put the object into different layers, and um, uh, the other things, I skip them for now since we don't use it. And on the left side, you have the tool shelf where you basically can do everything related to uh, object manipulation. Um, you already saw, I just uh, can also do some transformations here by just clicking on the translate button, and I can move it around, just like I did with my shortcut here, G for grab, I can move it around, or I can do some rotational transformation here, and I can also scale, and so on. So, and let's go on. On the right side here, you have um, the main menu. It is split into diff different uh, categories, all related to the global scene here. Uh, on the, uh, you can switch through the different categories by just clicking the buttons here on top. Um, I will uh, just uh, leave it for now uh, 
since I uh, we don't use it um, all for this project, I'm just uh, explaining a few of them, which is the modifier section. I will come to, back, to this back again uh, in, uh, soon. So I'm now, oh, I see we need to switch to our new renderer, Cycles, which is already mentioned by uh, Carson. Um, this is a different type of renderer, and you already see um, the material section is changing here um, because it depends pretty much on the renderer you selected here on top. So, okay, let's uh, just explain something here, what you can do with the object. Whoops, that was a bit often press the button. So you can just rotate and navigate in the, in the uh, viewport here. Uh, you can also move the camera around and everything, zooming and uh, what you want. So you can also edit the object uh, itself, the base geometry. You can uh, take some vertices, uh, vertex, or uh, just edit them, moving around like the object as a whole. And you also can select uh, different kind of elements here, like the faces or polygons. It's a geometry object. So uh, you can also just edit them and delete them and uh, extend them here, which I will do for our uh, object uh, in a minute. So you see, you can just create something without much effort. So uh, let's go back to these uh, categories I want, want to explain. The modifier section is also uh, a pretty important thing since they are also there to, to create and to change geometry of the object here, um, but not in the same way as I do by hand here manually. Um, you can just automatically uh, use some options here to uh, manipulate the geometry on a procedural level, so you can, let's make an example here, uh, let's just add an array modifier. You see it's, it's a, our base object is duplicated and I can just increase here the number to create lots of instances of the same object and uh, uh, it will soon become clear why it is pretty uh, easy tool and pretty uh, useful tool for, uh, for this because you can do manipulations without changing the base geometry and it is quite uh, non-destructive so you can always get back to the um, normal object without changing the topology or the, the mesh itself. You can even get back to our base object here, uh, change some geometry and you see the um, procedural a modifier will always update the whole array here to the new, uh, to all our actual object. So I just can remove it here without any changes to our base object and we are back at the beginning. Another interesting modifier is the mo subdivision modifier. This is what we will use here for, this, for our example, for our uh, device I'm modeling right now in a minute. Um, this is basically uh, is generating geometry based on the base mesh, of course, uh, but by subdividing and interpolating the surface to a smoother uh, representation of the, of the base surface. So you see you can make smooth surfaces without much effort and you can extend them as usual as uh, before. You can extrude edges here and you can form some kind of surfaces uh, every kind of surfaces you as you want. So, I think it's enough for now for this uh, uh, introduction uh, for, for the user interface. Uh, let's go and start with our object. I'm just adding a primitive here. You have various uh, primitives uh, at your choice. You can just um, add cylinder if you want to make a car or anything like this. So you have uh, less effort to just create something. So, but our uh, device will be some kind of smartphone, I thought. Uh, it would be interesting since uh, Sebastian uh, sent me an email uh, with a link um, suggesting some, some objects. And this, this was a website with some smartphones, so I, I just thought 
don't be creative, just make a smartphone, and <laughs> this is what we're doing right now. I'm just using as a base object as a cylinder. I'm scaling it a bit into Z direction here, uh, and I see the language switched here. I just getting it back. So now again, I'm just scaling it in the wider set Z axis like this, making it a bit flatter. Like you can also enter a number as you saw already. Uh, I'm just making it a bit less wide, like 0.5, and maybe it's a bit thick. Still, just make it a bit flatter. So now we have already a nice shape here, um, which could be a smartphone, but it's a bit uh, uh, well sharp edged, edged. So let's add some subdivision modifier as I as we have learned before. So I'm just adding some more subdivisions here to get a nice smooth surface, uh, maybe uh, even more. Uh, this this uh, system has the power to calculate it real time here. Oops, so this is also a bit often. So let's get in. I'm switching the shading to smooth shading, uh, even if, if it's, uh, uh, that it's not necessary since we have so much subdivisions here, you, you can't even tell where the faces are. So it, it looks a bit too modern for my taste, so I'm just adding some more uh, subdivisions here, like two ones, so I'm scaling it a bit wider, so we get some nice uh, corners here, some nice round corners, and maybe on in this direction too, just scaling it a bit in, in the ax to, uh, axis here, so, and now we already have a bit more angular uh, shape. Let's make the edges here on top a bit sharper, which you can do so you have some more control about the subdivision modifier uh, by just, uh, let's redo it. I'm just making it a bit transparent so you can see through it. I'm just switching now. Shift E is uh, the edge crease, changing the edge crease. And you see you can make sharper edges here just by adding a number or moving the mouse. And you see you have now a more sharp edge on top on, and on the uh, bottom. You have a bit more round uh, edges and corners. So I'm just putting it above, uh, a bit above uh, ground level here uh, for later. Since we want to add an, an environment here as well, to make a final render of it in the end. So now we have the basic shape and I'm adding some more subdivisions to prepare our um, details, some details I want to introduce. Uh, and now I'm just adding a line for our bu buttons here, which uh, I intend to position here. And now I'm adding another uh, subdivision to make a little uh, border to the display, to the later display, and I'm just going on and adding here something in this, on this side. Um, this will be our, uh, an opening for our whatever speaker or something like this. So I'm just a nice detail, I think, would, would help to make it a bit more convincible. So, um, so uh, we have some raw structure, and now I'm just making it a bit uh, wider, I think, since we want to have a nice, a larger, a larger display, a bit wider display. So uh, I'm just selecting here the whole thing. And also I'm deselecting these ones. And I'm scaling it a bit. Oh, let's go to our autogital uh, view. Uh, so now I'm that was a wrong key, so scaling it a bit wider. Like this, one second. Oh, I separated it. I just didn't want this to happen. Okay, now it's connected. Let's do it again. I'm just scaling it a bit wider. So that's what I wanted to have a nice uh, small border here. So let's add some, a few subdivisions for our buttons. I intend to create three buttons here on this side, and it, it doesn't matter if we have some subdivision on this side. Uh, we just 
make it uh, that way since um, <clears throat> it will be a bit easier to uh, select things later. Deselection, so. And now I'm already, uh, well, okay, no, we, we leave it to, to a bit later, uh, the material section. Um, let's add some opening here for our speaker, maybe a bit smaller, not too wide. I'm using extrude to push it a bit in, so we have some depth here. I'm using edge crease to make it a bit sharper. I'm selecting the neighboring faces and increasing edge crease as well. So we have some angular opening here. And now I'm going to uh, add some buttons on the lower, right, uh, lower side here. I'm just doing the same in principle as the uh, speaker opening, I'm just using extrude to extrude, and nothing is moving here. So, and you see the subdivision modifier also smooths out our buttons. You could uh, say, okay, we can, could uh, use it as rubber buttons, but I don't want to have rubber buttons, so I'm just uh, pushing it in, and I'm creating some kind of uh, gap here, some opening, where our uh, buttons will fit in, in a second. So I'm just increasing edge crease here again, but I want to have it round, so I'm just leaving out some of these edges here, so I'm just decreasing the edge crease for these particular edge rings here. Minus one. So, and you see it's kind of a strange shaped opening here. Let's make them also minus one. And I hope they are looking, well, not correctly here. We forgot these two edges. I'm just disabling here the edge crease again. So now we have round holes for our buttons and we can continue to add the buttons itself. Um, in the end, we will have some nice uh, and, and hopefully convincing gap between the button and the uh, casing itself. Um, this is what I intend to try here. Let's extrude them to the top now along the z-axis a bit above the surface here, and let's remove the edge crease to some part so we get some nice round shape uh, for our buttons. I think this looks really well, I think. Uh, the gap is also visible here, not too much, but when we add some uh, materials, we will have shadows and we will have reflections, and then it gets more apparent uh, what we did here. So I'm just pushing it uh, a bit more in, not too much, and I'm just dis uh, removing some more edge crease, making it a bit rounder. Uh, I like it a bit more that way. So, okay, and let's indent this, this, this center button here is some kind of directional pad, so I'm just making it a bit larger, not too large. Uh, so, like this, and I'm just moving it a bit away from the display here. So, uh, I think it looks okay. And now, we can start to add materials to our object here. And I'm just selecting the faces I want to uh, assign materials to. So, I'm just adding two materials here. New and another one new. Uh, we can also rename it to display so we know what we are doing here and what material is what, casing. So, and uh, the first material is automatically assigned to all faces here and so I just have to assign the second one and you can still not see anything since we have the same default color here. I'm just making it a bit darker so we have some display color. You see it looks a bit strange, a bit smaller than expected. This is because of the um, subdivision modifier which also smooths out the uh, flat faces and uh, even areas. So I'm just 
increasing the edge crease even if there is no edge visible. Um, so I'm having here some round edges left over. I just need to select the neighboring edges to add some edge crease here as well. And now we have some nice uh, looking display here fitting exactly where our edges are. So let's add some uh, shader, but at first I should uh, enable the viewport renderer and here comes in our cycles render system which can render live uh, in the viewport here. We don't have to wait for a final render. We can just, let's disable the menus here. Uh, we can just render here live in the display and the, in the viewport and I just need to enable rendered here and now it is prepared and you see already there is something visible. It uses the default lighting so it's a bit boring. I'm just switching to GPU render uh, so that it's a bit quicker and now we can add some material. Uh, let's uh, improve our material, I would say. Uh, so switches, uh, let's switch it to a glossy shader, so it is reflecting the environment. We have, haven't have, uh, we have no environment at, uh, at the moment, so I'm just, uh, there's not much visible. I'm just adding a scene here so we can see actual background and something reflectance, reflecting here. I'm just adding a ground plane. We already shifted our object above the ground plane, so it is not intersecting with each other. I'm just uh, using the camera now for our, I'm positioning it for our final image later. So let's have it like this here in our viewport. I'm just placing it right so we have a nice uh, fitting uh, image here. So let's add some more, uh, well, we don't need really a, a, another background. We have the ground plan, it's, this should be enough. Um, okay, let's get back to our object. We already switched to glossy shader, which is a display here. We make it a bit darker, so it is reflecting not so much. And also now we need to, to uh, switch a glossy shader to our casing, which I intend to be some kind of metal, which is reflecting the environment as well. It looks also still a bit dark, so I'm just adding some lighting here. Uh, and this is the default light, I'm just increasing the size. So we have some uh, smoother shadows, and I'm just uh, increasing the energy here. I think it's in watts, but um, we, uh, we don't use an actual um, size and precise uh, real world size, so I'm just designing it at the moment uh, without um, with, le with leaving out the actual and um, realistic ro real world size. You can use metric system here and you can use units and <clears throat> define precise what size you want to have if it's like 10 centimeters or anything uh, in this uh, size. So, but at the moment it's, its size doesn't matter, I would say. So I'm just continuing here with our design. We can rescale it later on and it's not a problem at all. So, we have an environment. We have some, oh I see, it's a bit, there is some edge visible, so I'm get, getting a bit close, I'm not too close. It's not that quick. Okay. Maybe we should get a bit uh, back here and just adding some background edges here to fill our uh, uh, corner, corners here of our final image. Uh, we can use the subdivision modifier just to enable uh, to make a smoother surface here in the background so we ha don't have some sharp edges there. I'm just enabling smooth threading again here for this. And you see you have some nice gradient here. This is a, a very often used trick to just fill the background 
without sharp edges. So now let's add some more lighting. Let's enable, re-enable the renderer again. So we see what we are actually doing. And I'm just copying the, the, the light source to give it more, um, uh, to give it to um, produce some light, uh, lighting from a different direction. I'm just re re uh, reducing the energy here. And maybe we can increase the size to make a soft, softer shadow on the other side. So, and now you see already there are sh some shape, uh, some nice reflections here. Uh, there is something out, I see. There is some strange reflection here which looks like the, uh, the corner is uh, cut off. So I'm just pushing the background a bit down so we don't have this reflection there. So, and now let's improve our materials the last time by just, uh, I don't have to disable the render here, by adding some more roughness to make the reflections a bit more diffuse, so it, it's, not, uh, it's not producing such sharp reflections. Maybe a bit more for our casing, since we don't want to have a perfect mirror here. Um, <clears throat> so, and now we still have no real uh, um, reflections here. We, we should change this by just, um, just at first we should to uh, removing the background color so we can produce our own lighting. I'm adding some plane here to have something to be reflected here. I'm just putting it, putting it over our scene, adding some emission shader here, some lighting. It is uh, more or less uh, an aerial lighting light. And now I'm just increasing the energy a bit and we have to position it so that we see the actual reflection here of this plane in our uh, render. And you see already yes, 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 we get some more bright areas. So we, all, we are on the right way. I'm just pushing it a bit more here in this direction. Where is it? It's moving around. Maybe it's a bit more in this way here. And you see where cycles is very interesting. As an helper, you already see a live uh, feedback of uh, you, what you're doing in the scene. And there is the right, right position. I'm just adding a texture to making it a bit more interesting. I'm just here enabling rendering here as well. So we see what texture we have there. I'm just adding a gradient texture and switching it to quadratic type of texture. So we can fake some horizon reflection here, which is, pretty, which is a pretty good way since you have uh, full control about what you are doing, uh, how you position the horizon and the reflection. So let's move it around a bit so we can have a nice uh, reflection there. It's a bit diffuse. I'm not sure why is it. Let's select our object. Let's select the display. No, it's okay. Maybe we should make it a bit larger. And you see you can actually position it right. So I'm just going back to our uh, object here. I'm not sure why it is so diffuse. It should be a bit sharper, the reflection. Ah, I see now it's there. Moving it a bit into this. Maybe it's a bit large. Last time I tried, so it went a bit quicker. Ah, there is it, I see. Okay, let's make it a bit smaller. And now we have our reflection there. I'm just um, making our roughness back to 
0.002 and we see it's a bit sharper, uh, dif more diffuse than I thought, so I'm just making it smaller again. I'm rotating it. So I'm not sure why it is like this or... Okay, so we should move it a bit closer so we are sure that it's actually on the right position. I'm unsure why it is not where I intended it to be. Maybe I did something wrong here. I'm just looking at the renderer to make sure that it's at the correct position. Yeah, I think it's okay. Let's make it a bit and rotate it a bit into this direction. I'm not sure why it is like this. It should be should be a, a bit different. Ah, now I see. We uh, we forgot to enable the camera. That can be uh, pretty misleading. So I'm just removing it again here, putting it back to back to our values I had before, and now I think. We can position it correctly. I'm just scaling it a bit so we have filled our display with a nice reflection. So, and I think it's okay for now. I'm just adding another plane um, to fill the front uh, black edge here um, just to give it a final touch. Um, just adding another emission shader here as before. Uh, where's the emission shader here? So, I'm increasing the energy a bit and I'm positioning it so that it's reflecting nicely at this kernel here, which is pretty dark for my taste. So I'm just moving it above the surface until I see it and into the reflection. I'm just maybe increasing the size. And you see it's already get, we become here, we get some reflection. And I'm just rotating it like the other um, top light here. And I'm just scaling it so we have the same shape here at the local axis. Let's position it a bit more into this direction. And you see now it's a bit brighter there. And I think this is very impressive for the talk. Okay. So we have to spare the rest for the actual um, workshops because we're running out of time here. Okay, I'm just... Uh, finished already, I'm just uh, doing a final render here, increasing the sampling rate, um, so we have a nice final image. Um, and that's uh, it, I think. Just uh, add some samples here so we have some nice image. And I'm just, I uh, think, we are ready to render. Just adding some optimization here to get it quick, more quickly, noise-free, and just should be our final render, I hope. Let's wait a second and then it should be done. Oh yeah. <laughs> so this was a just-in-time production. Thank you for this. Uh, we have about two minutes for questions. Um, if they're too complex, please spare it for the workshop. Okay, there's one in the front, one in the back. Um, have you used SolidWorks very much? I, I'm mostly a SolidWorks user myself and was just curious how you would compare the modeling chain to SolidWorks. Is it sort of like a parametric sort of modeling tool where you can go back and change a step and then recreate the model having had that step change, you know, 10 steps back? I don't think so. Um, there's only this, this, this modifier stack where you can actually change uh, settings and removing options, and, uh, but the general editing of the mesh isn't uh, um, removable that uh, easy. There's no real uh, chance to get it back uh, without some uh, more effort you 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 what i'm doing what i'm used to do is um, to make a backup of an important step of the uh, process 
and um, you can just duplicate it, the object and put it on a different layer, uh, which is uh, invisible, and then you have already the chance to get back and use it again. Uh, there's, there's no such way to reproduce uh, the old uh, steps of your uh, process. All right, thanks. Unfortunately. Uh, Okay, thank you. Because we have to we, uh, prepare the room for the next talk, uh, which will be immediately now. Um, thank you again for your presentation and for your talk. Um, be reminded that the workshop on Blender is exactly now. Uh, so just follow our speakers to the workshop area. The room should already be prepared with Beamer and some outlets. So, uh, yeah, in two minutes we will have uh, Benjamin Hadelsberger here. <laughs>